You're listening to the Reversing Climate Change podcast by the team at Nori, the carbon removal marketplace. This is a show about the innovators and entrepreneurs developing solutions to climate change. Hello and welcome to the Reversing Climate Change podcast with Nori. I'm Ross Kenny, and I'm one of the co-founders of Nori and the head of, oh wait, I have a new title now. I'm the director of creative and marketing. That's new. That really I sticks know. in my craw a little bit. Used to <laughs> sing the old ways. But yeah, joined by Siobhan Montoya Lavender, as we often do these shows together. Hey, Shiv. Hey, Ross. How's it going? Uh, it's going well. Why don't you introduce our guest? He has a very cool picture behind him. I feel like I just have a blank, blank wall behind me. I know. He's really upstaging us with the background here. Today, we are joined by Carlo Mondavi, who is the co-founder and chief farming officer of Monarch Tractor. And so today, we're going to be learning all about smart electric tractors, how we're going to revolutionize ag, how we're going to cut carbon emissions, and really build a regenerative system here. So Ooh. welcome, Carlo. You're just Thanks, like first guys. person pluralizing that, huh? You want to take credit for, for it? we're going to do this? <laughs> <laughs> On this very podcast. Okay. Nice. Carlo, share your, share your amazing story with us here. We're going to take credit for it. So <laughs> go ahead. Awesome. How does this happen? Hey, great. You know, uh, there's a huge, huge, uh, you know, responsibility in being able to shine a light on things. So thank you guys for taking the time to meet with me and talk about this really, really incredible project that I've been able to get involved in. Um, yeah, my background's a little different than uh, I'm a farmer and a winemaker first. So how I got involved in technology and then Monarch Tractor is a little bit of a a, a longer way about um, in terms of I just- mean, you're Napa royalty, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. it's that, you're like personal friends with the Coppolas, I imagine. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> nice, yeah. No, um, yeah, farming, I, you know, we- I always remember uh, the first time my my father because you know we my when my grandfather Robert um, you know was really trying to prove that we can make wines that could sit in the company of the best wines of the world here in California um, we didn't have to be in Bordeaux or Burgundy or in Piemonte in Italy um, that we could do it right here that we had the soil the climate the know how he really wanted to kind of dress the part so he he um, you know at the time that was kind of like mad men 1950s like more sport <laughs> coats and and so I kind of grew up in a more formal setting. And I remember the first time I heard, um, you know, we're farmers first. It really hit me like that because I love the farm. I love the dirt. I love working in the vineyards. And that's where I spent most of my time. But, you know, just to know that that when we're out enjoying wines uh, around the world, that that it all comes from the dirt. It all comes from the farm. And so, um, yeah, no, it, I, it's it's uh, Napa Valley is a beautiful place. And that's one of the reasons why I got involved in, in Monarch Tractor. Carlo, you're wearing a Monarch hat right now. What's with the name Monarch? Why did you choose that? Yeah, so um, that name comes back from a movement that I began back around, well, I began the Monarch Challenge in 2016. And the Monarch Challenge um, is a name that stems from uh, since the beginning of Roundup in 1974, since the introduction of Roundup in 74, which is a herbicide. And farming, um, you know, there's all sorts of things. In the wintertime, after the rains, the grasses grow. Um, we have to deal with all those grasses. And historically, the way our great, great grandparents and, and, and generations before would deal with that would be with just mowing, cutting the grasses. Um, but it's a lot of work. If it rains again, you have to go out and cut it, the grasses again. And so since the introduction of, of, uh, of 74, this uh, roundup in 74, this chemical became this um, really, really fast growing um, uh, product that that farmers adopted to basically chemically mow um, their fields. And so I began seeing this, um, uh, you know, around 2004, 2005, 2006 in California, uh, in Napa Valley. And I began questioning, why would you spray these chemicals that, that, you know, kill the grasses versus mowing? And, and why would you use these around the root ball of, of, uh, you know, the plants that you're trying to grow that create products that we eat, drink, et cetera. And, um, I quickly learned, you know, through, researching about glyphosate back in 1974, um, the introduction through Monsanto, with Monsanto, that um, since this introduction that the monarch population of butterflies has declined by 99%, they're now on the brink of extinction. And monarch butterflies are, are indicator species. They're uh, like the wolves of Yellowstone or the, the Pacific salmon of the North or, um, you know, so many beautiful indicator species on our planet. If we can protect our planet's indicator species, we can protect so much more. And so, uh, I created this movement called the Monarch Challenge in 2016 to go out and just create awareness within my farming community, because I really 
felt that if farmers knew this is before the Monsanto lawsuits and a lot of that. So this was kind of an unknown. Um, I, I linked up with Dr. Stephanie Seneff, who's a senior researcher at MIT, I learned about the human health impact, um, talked with some professors at Harvard to talk about the to learn more about the environmental impact and wanted to create awareness within this within the farming community in Napa Valley. I've always felt that the wine business can kind of help shine the light that, that we can um, that we have the financial fortitude. We're not in the penny crops like corn and soy that we can um, you know, shine the light on, on this and hopefully uh, elevate farming and create a path that other farmers can follow. And so I wanted to create awareness simply. I've always felt that you know, if farmers know something, because not, not one farmer on this planet wants to harm Mother Earth. Every farmer on this planet cares deeply about their soils and their farm. And so by being able to create awareness about this that that we could um hopefully migrate away from it and so the name the monarch challenge came from um, the beautiful monarch butterflies and uh but it, it's tied to you know since the introduction this is this is kind of a crazy number this is a new study that came out of europe um but that showed that since the year 2000 80 percent of our planets and or, or europe's insect biomass has disappeared and with it 50 percent of the bird population and scientists are saying that this is more of a global um kind of number that we can, you know, if you look in the US, if you look at India, if you look at Asia, that numbers are similar there, that there's this huge insect and avian apocalypse happening right now. And so back in 2016, I just wanted to create awareness and talk with farmers because I figured, hey, if we have this conversation that, you know, farms would just migrate away from it. And I quickly learned in talking with my friends and um, and, and other fellow farmers that that there was an, an a, a economic divide Many farmers that I would talk to would, would, with a tear in their eyes, say, look, we didn't realize that this is hurting our soil microbiome and farm biology and has all these human health implications and whatnot, um, but we've got to put food on our table. We've got to put our family, our, our kids through college. Um, and I learned quickly that there was this economic divide, that to go out and use, you know, to, to go without these chemicals, that you'd have to drive your tractor more, and that meant more hours. And that meant just, uh, you know, there's, there's also, this is a crazy number, but there's a, a huge labor shortage. Um, I, I think that this is something that we all know, but um, I, I don't know if you, so like 1900, um, half of the population of the United States was farming and today it, it's 1.8%. So there's been this exodus that's been, you know, literally farmers would say, Hey, like I'm working my my butt off so my kids can go to college and become a doctor or a lawyer or just get off the farm type of thing. Um, there's been this exodus. And so I also learned that it was something like 43% of farms in America are not profitable. And so when these families would tell me with a tear in their eye that they, they've got to put their kids through college. And also there was a lot of kind of, you know, the, the chemical industry was really pushing up against, um, you know, I don't want to say with misinformation, but they were really trying to say, hey, you know, there was a point in time when when people would say you can drink Roundup, you can drink glyphosate. <laughs> it's just like crazy. Ooh, ooh, and uh, they were saying it, it's that safe. Yeah, yeah, crazy. And so there there was, it was, you know, it's constant, like just, it's a capitalistic business, right? They're trying to make money. And so they're trying to grow their business. And so they're trying to say how safe a lot of these things are. And it's, and it's fine. It's just that, it's simple. If you can mow, you can have a hundred percent reduction of a chemical, right? And so this economic divide was just this like huge, 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 massive divide for these families. You know, if, if 43% of farms are are profitable, it means 57% of the farms in America are struggling. And so I then would talk to larger farms at scale and they would say, look, we realize that this chemical is something we don't want to use. We, we agree it's not great, but uh, if you drive your tractor more, a small tractor the size of Monarch um, is like turning on 14 cars and it's NOx particulate and CO2. And so we also believe in climate change and we want to address climate change. So we want to drive our tractor less. So using these stronger chemicals um, actually helps us uh, have a lower carbon footprint. And also we have wow. to report to our shareholders and it, and it costs less. And so there's this economic divide and this carbon footprint divide that was separating um, the clean world of agriculture, protecting our soil microbiome and farm biology and our climate. Um, and, and so it was a very tough time. This was around 2017 when the wildfires broke out in Napa Valley. And I was at probably my most depressed state because I was just thinking to myself, you know, it, it was a tough time. The fires in 2017 were incredibly devastating here in, in, in California. And then they came back yeah. in 2020. But 
it was one of those moments where you kind of said, hey, we have to find a way to be able to bridge the economic divide and the carbon footprint divide. Because when you look at farming today, um, you know, it encompasses 50% of our planet's inhabitable land. It uses 70% of our freshwater resources. Um, and it's responsible for one third of our, our, of our carbon footprint. So like California, for example, we're 100 million acres of land of which, you know, it's, it's uh, 43 of those million acres are agricultural. So all these products of, of the 9 billion pounds of pesticides, 5 billion are herbicides. Those get sprayed into our soils. They harm the soil microbiome. They harm the farm biology. They harm our water table. They harm the air. They harm the products that we're growing, all of these things. And so, but the, so the monarch challenge literally just, it, it was to create awareness about this um, massive problem that we have in agriculture. And the reason why we innovated to create Monarch Tractor uh, was simply because uh, we had to bridge the economic divide and we had to bridge the carbon footprint divide. And so by being all electric, um, which our tractor is, um, we can go from the fossil fuel era of farming and into the renewable era of farming. And then by being autonomous, which is, um, I think the, people don't understand autonomy and, and kind of, they think, Oh, like it's AI. So that means that you're just getting rid of labor. And that's, that's not the case at all. The AI is actually helping protect us as farmers uh, by taking us out of the most dangerous place on the farm, which is in the, the tractor seat this year alone in Piemonte, um, there've been seven deaths by tractor operators. The last one was a 68, 68 year old gentleman who rolled the tractor and, and was tragically killed. So it's all, it's not just that it's also the slow, you know, wearing a hazmat suit and driving the tractor and spraying, even organic contact sprays are not good to be in the plume of, but yeah. the autonomy isn't just for the human health. It's really for, for the ability for us to reduce all those chemicals. So there's 9 billion pounds of pesticides, the hundred million tons of fertilizer by being able to slow things down, we can have hundred percent reductions of things like herbicides, massive reductions of fungicides and insecticides and things like that. So it's. Yeah. Yeah. Ross, did you have one? I can jump in. No, I saw a video the other day of um, a farm implement using lasers to to kill certain kinds of weeds. And I was just thinking about. I think people think people think I'm looking outward from my own perspective. But I'm not from a farm family at all, so I don't have this experience. But it does feel kind of like set, like the technology has been developed and not a lot changes, and it's just sort of the way that it is and kind of always has been for fifty years. Um, but it's cool to see things yeah. like that happening where you're saying, oh, actually, we don't need to mess with a biological or chemical level on the fields as much anymore. There's technology coming that is actually much more mechanical and advanced and therefore much less interventionist in this uh, microbiotic kind of way. Um, it's exciting to see. Yeah, it's it's super exciting. I think um, when you look at the first half of the 20th century, it was the original like tractors, right? The The first tractors and those tractors were about how can we become more efficient as farmers. And then the second half of the... 20th century, post-World War I, World War II, the whole like kind of green revolution, I always call it the chemical revolution, it was about how chemicals could um, re make us more efficient, essentially. And today, now, I think that the exciting thing through those types of technology, like you're talking about those lasers, um, is how can we use technology to have a, a lower carbon footprint? How can we use technology to use less inputs, chemicals, all those things, and go back to the way maybe that our great grandparents farmed, but with technologies that allow for us to also deal with the, 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 the you know, labor challenges that we have and the economic cha challenges that we have and the massive need and uh, for us to be able to scale our food um, ecosystem. So um, it, technology has come a long way. It's actually the same. It's that mechanical intervention is basically what it would be like if you had farm hands available. Speaking of, I was just listening to Robert Leckie's Helmet for My Pillow, the World War II memoir, and he was talking about how many of the Marines he served with were farmhands. How many farmhands have you met, Siobhan? <laughs> have you ever mm -hmm. met someone who identifies as a farmhand? I'm like, this is this is definitely a time capsule kind of book. <laughs> I mean, I've met a lot, Siobhan. Are you... <laughs> yeah, well, asking you is different. Again, like, yeah, that, that doesn't count. <laughs> well, I think You're a civilian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually think, speaking of this, I think it's really interesting that that Monarch and this concept of an electric tractor is coming from a multi-generational farmer. Because I think we think a lot about disruption as something coming from outside, you know, right? It's like new first-gen farmers getting into the business, coming with fresh eyes. And I think it's really interesting and cool that here you are, a Mondavi, generational farmer, and you were like, from within the system, no, no, I, I think I can see this differently. I think we could change this. 
And I think that just speaks a lot to your own kind of like mindset. Um, and I'm kind of curious more about like how you became the guy who was like, let's really shake things up, you know? <laughs> and I think, you know, obviously there's like some shaking up in your history of family, but you as a person, like, so I actually met Carlo long ago when I think I was probably about 10 years old and That's you were 17 more or less maybe. And yeah, exactly. at that time, I thought, mm -hmm. I thought you were going to be a professional snowboarder and we should dive into that because I think you were for a little bit because what happened was, so Carlo and a bunch of his friends lived at this private school and they would come to my dad, my dad's house where I lived to jump on the trampoline because we had a big trampoline. And what they did is they took a very cool skateboard. trampoline. <laughs> it was a really good, super unsafe, like no, you know, no safety nets, one of those like giant, you know, rectangular shapes. And I remember what you guys did is you took a skateboard, you took off the wheels and then you drilled shoes onto it and then you wrapped it in duct tape so they wouldn't damage the trampoline. And you guys would practice like grabs on the trampoline. And this, you know, I was a 10 year old kid being like, these have to be the coolest humans on earth <laughs> that, are, that are doing flips out here with their skateboard duct tape. Um, and so you went from like, you're a Mondavi, you're this, you know, snowboarding person who left to do pro snowboarding. Tell us a little about like how you became this person who's like, I'm going to build a tractor that's going to change the agricultural industry. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, so I guess going, going back to that thing, Thanks, uh, Siobhan. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> those memories are so great. I love uh, looking back at, in Colorado. So this was in Colorado, um, uh, up in like the mountains and the Rockies and just absolutely the most beautiful place. And I, I grew up surfing and skateboarding here in California. And when I, I when I went out that way, I got into snowboarding and, um, and thanks again for letting us come over and use your trampoline. That was a lot of fun <laughs> <laughs> being able to, to practice uh, what we wanted to go do on, on, <laughs> Um, a little bit more risky of a, a surface with the uh, icy snow and whatnot. Um, yeah, going back to, you know, when I look at my grant, we, we've constantly, farmers and winemakers are innovators, right? We are constantly having to react to what's happening with mother nature. So if something happens, we have to innovate and we have to be on the fly and we have to react quickly. So I've always thought about um, how each year we're kind of engineering um, and we're or working with climate to kind of engineer the the vineyard to react like how is the canopy laying out is it going to be a hot year do we need more dappled sunlight do we need more laterals all these little things that we do in the vineyard but my grandfather really innovated back in in, in the 60s um, to pioneer stainless steel it was the first time he went to the milk industry to pioneer stainless steel um, for for tanks because we didn't understand microbiology at the level we do now and so he used yeah, that's just like standard at this point, right? Like it's pretty, pretty rare to use wood still, or it's like a, a prestige yeah. item rather than the norm. Well, now that we understand microbiology at a higher level, we can now know how to clean um, wood barrels. So people have gone back to wood barrels um, or wood tanks for fermentation um, and some of these like concrete vessels and whatnot. But back then we didn't understand microbiology. So if you got Brett or Eniococcus or Pediococcus in your barrels or in your winery, it was kind of, oh, well, that's going to be there forever. Uh, so, so my grandfather pioneered stainless steel because he said, I want to have a blank canvas every year. I want to understand the site and I want to understand that vintage with a lot of transparency. And so I'm, I'm kind of this like long way around back to, um, you know, I, I think just that I had that innovative, like kind of engineering background, just, hey, we have to react. We have to figure out things. If, if something's not working out, it doesn't mean that that has to continue to be that way. You can innovate to make things work out. And so I think that that seed was planted in my mind from a young age. And um, the reason how I got involved with Monarch and this, this technology company, and I have to say, it's my my three brilliant co-founders who are really the geniuses behind the engineering. They, they've got an incredible background in, in engineering. But the way that I got involved in this was through desperation. You know, I kind of quickly realized that if we continue to farm the way that we're farming using these chemicals, um, you know, my family's four generations of, of what I'd call beyond organic farming. But I kept seeing that at scale as the consolidation of these small and medium sized family wineries were being consolidated into larger, larger, larger conglomerates, that there was this kind of 101 farming prescriptive that was that was very dangerous that, that, and, and to be honest, everyone was kind of stuck. They were stuck because that was the only way they could do it because of the exodus of the labor force, because there wasn't the teams to do it. They needed to do that. And then because of the demand in the market, they had to also do that for economic reasons. And so I saw this dangerous 
kind of on the on the on the pesticide side thing of happening with herbicides and all of that that I really wanted to change. And then I saw this other thing happening on the climate side where the climate was becoming so inhospitable that it was becoming more and more difficult to be able to create a crop each year with with relative consistency, just you know, severe weather. Um, and so I, I, I saw those things coming together. Monarch Challenge was going to fail because of the economic divide and the carbon footprint divide. And that was when I got the introduction of a lifetime to my co-founders, to Mark Praveen and Zachary, who are brilliant engineers out of Silicon Valley. And I had kind of put two and two together through technologies like Tesla, which Mark, who's the president and my co-founder, had helped uh, in the early days of Tesla to help kind of scale that business. Um, but I put two and two together. If you can have an autonomous you know, electric car going 80 miles per hour, per hour down a freeway. Why couldn't you have a tractor be electric and autonomous going down a, a farm row at two and three miles per hour? You know, it seems logical. And so, you know, Praveen and Zachary had come to that conclusion independent of, of kind of uh, what I thought would be a good solution. They had, they had said, hey, this is a, a great, so we, needless to say, <laughs> we came together and we, we began Monarch Tractor. And so it's, this was a long, this is four years ago, you know, our biggest challenge was really um, getting people to pay attention to agriculture on the technology sector. The technology sector was so focused on, you know, software as a service and just how can we get 80% returns and all this stuff that, that um, you know, it, it, the, the agricultural sector seemed kind of not very sexy to them. And I think when you think about agriculture, it is the the most important, you know, farmers are the most important people on our planet. They literally feed us, right? And uh, when you look at farming, it is, I think, the most sexy job on the planet. We get to work with the dirt. We get to work with nature. We get to work, uh, you know, and and plant things and grow them and, and, and reap the benefits of working with the land. And so um, we've been working, things have changed so much. I think now that, you know, uh, the last COP, um, you know, the world, world governments talked about farming as an important uh, subject matter to talk about addressing climate change. For the first time, it was an actual like centerpiece of the conversation, um, which is crazy. And um, so things are changing quickly, but um, we need all of these sectors to change for us to be successful. Agriculture was just one of the missing links, shipping, you know, um, travel, uh, all, all of industry, um, certainly agriculture, we need to we need to revolutionize them so we get away from the, the carbon footprint that's associated with them, get to some sort of renewable footprint that's regenerative that allows for us to have healthy soils, healthy foods, healthy airs, healthy water, uh, and a planet that's, that's um, you know, sustainable. Are you going to ask about she thinks my tractor's sexy or do you want me to do it? <laughs> <laughs> I was not. I was not. I leave, Did you have a real question? I, okay. I leave those yeah. low balls to you. <laughs> um, I guess a, an important question for me is thinking about, you know, you being a farmer, teaming up with some engineers, how is this being received by other farmers? Like, I think you have an inside track, but I think something we butt up against a lot in climate tech is when, especially when it comes to ag, is like connecting with actual farmers on the ground and like, how does it impact them? How are they receiving new tech? Yeah, no, it's, so I think farmers are, um, as a farmer, I know all the pain points, right? I know how difficult it is when you're going to, you know, pick a crop and you can't get the team you need to to pick it. Um, I, I know a lot of the challenges that um, we're facing as a community. And so, um, you know, I, I kind of, with the tractor, um, you know, was thinking a lot about how, um, you know, how do we address a lot of the pain points that we have? You know, no farmer, you know, if, if you talk to farms, all farms um, simply want to, you know, leave the land in a better position than they received it for their families. They want to be able to pass on that land to the next generation. And we right now are put into a position where instead of you know, well, well, let me just put it this way. I, I, sorry, I rambled on that. The, the, the technology has been received really, really, really well. Um, I think that when you look at, if you, if you would go to a farmer before Monarch Tractor and you said, hey, don't use herbicides on your farm, they would tell you to get the hell off your farm. You know, basically it's a yeah, pounds, get, get out of here, man. But if you go to them and say, hey, what if we had something that could allow for you to um, 
not have to pay for herbicides anymore? What if you could save money on herbicides? Um, what if you could reduce your cost on purchasing fungicides potentially? Um, what if we could reduce your diesel costs and all of these things? So if you can open the door and talk about saving farmers money is, is kind of the way we can move forward in this. Because right now, um, it's very difficult to, to be a farmer and to, to cut it. Uh, climate change is making it more difficult. Farmers are on the front line of climate change. And so, you know, I mean, just this, this three weeks ago, my brother-in-law in Italy um, had a hailstorm that, that took out just about 100% of his crop in about 10 minutes. And so we're on the front lines of a lot of these challenges, these severe weather. And so, you know, so far, the, the, um, this is the first of its type. You know, and it's something that I think all farmers want to be able to automate, um, you know, mowing, for example, simply just mowing, being able to send the tractor out to automate mowing, to automate spraying, um, things like this uh, allow for us to have a better quality of life, to be able to reduce inputs and to be able to make more money. So, um, so far, it's been great. Um, we, we're now scaling. We have the world's best customers on, uh, literally the best customers on the planet um, here in California right now. We're now going up to Oregon and Washington and throughout the rest of the US. We've just now sent two tractors over to Europe where we're going to um, begin uh, promoting the tractors there at trade shows and, and start to build our team out there. So we're just now starting to, to get out there, which is exciting. But so far, the feedback's been very good. Is there a wait list? Yeah. Well, yes, yes. There it's, I kind of like, we're trying our best to get to a point where if you put in um, your deposit, so it's a $500 deposit, you put in your deposit that the tractors um, will be deployed like quickly in that growing season within months versus, you know, our, our we have very patient um, uh, customers so far that, you know, in the beginning days uh, they signed up on our launch and now we're just now releasing their tractors. And so now it's about speed and scale. That's also why we partnered, um, with an incredible contract manufacturer to help us grow quickly. So. I like the approach in general. I think the finger wagging approach you detailed of the don't use herbicides without offering. I mean, people are using herbicides for a reason, right? Yep. So like, if yep. you offering them a better solution to the underlying reason here that is healthier for them and their workers it is automated so that maybe there's less time involved for them having to be on the tractor going two or three miles an hour which by the way does not sound that thrilling of a <laughs> of a of a way to spend an What's afternoon the safety you just man mentioned yeah, i didn't even safety. know that there was like tractor deaths were a, you know a thing that we had to be concerned about you know you think you about never it, answered how many farm hands you've met so, so that <laughs> goes to tell I've us actually i've met quite a few farmers working on like ag fields doing um utility lines oh, okay. so, i, I promise you, you hands. <laughs> i promise you, you've met a lot more farmers at the coffee shop and stuff like you didn't know um <clears throat> that they spent their day on the farm i promise you I think it's it's a better way to go too. I think a lot of the conflict over climate and agriculture and the politics of it, I think they go away when you're just offering people, hey, this will save you money. This is going to make you and your family and your workers healthier. Like this is just a better way to go. I feel like the politics of this fall away really quickly. Yeah, yeah, no, it's um, it's I, and and we are you know one of the most conservative communities in in the world just because of the the challenges that farmers face in some, in terms of you know if you miss if you if you don't get a crop, you know, that's your whole entire year's work. So um, everyone has that muscle memory of that year, you know, going back when something happened, you know, whether it was a flood or severe winds or hail or a fire when they lost the entire crop. And, um, and so they save up for that. And so when we're able to hopefully make their lives a little bit more profitable, a little bit more resilient um, and, and make each farm a little bit more independent, it, it helps um, and it's exciting. It's an exciting time in agriculture. What do you think is going to happen with car manufacturers getting away from the internal combustion engine generally? And I imagine there's going to be state level policies that are also encouraging that. I mean, Washington and California both have said after a certain year, no more of them will be sold. I imagine agriculture is accepted from this, but the trend is definitely towards electrification. Um, how soon until someone like John Deere comes out with an electric tractor? I mean, I, I, my, my stance is like the sooner that all these companies can kind of get on board, the better for our planet right now. Like, I, I mean, I really look at this as a, um, you know, human life-threatening issue with climate change. And so the faster that we can 
you know, migrate away from the fossil fuel era into some renewable era, um, the better. Um, I also think we've, we've in combustion engine, you know, how inefficient they are. We've been kind of marketed and sold something that's not as efficient as an electric engine. It's just a better vehicle, like zero to 60, a, an electric vehicle just smokes any combustion engine, period. It's just a better vehicle. Regenerative braking means less brakes. You slow down, you're charging your battery. Um, tractors is the same way. I mean, the ability to have twice the torque in a tractor, that's exactly what you need is you need torque in farming. Is there really and that much of a performance difference between- Huge, the huge performance the difference. Really? Huge wow. performance difference, wow. yeah. Hmm. And then I think it's just, there's all these things that we can, we can you know, everything has been built in our whole entire, you know, ecosystem in terms of civilization right now um, has been built around the combustion kind of engine, if you think about it, like, or, or some form of burning hydrocarbons. And so if we can get away from, from, you know, all of these things, we, there's the ability to be, have, you know, off-grid, one of these tractors is, is greater than a hundred kilowatt hours. So 10 Monarchs is, is a mega, is greater than a megawatt hour. So if you have a farm of, you know, we, have, we, and we do have farms, by the way, that have no electrical infrastructure, literally someone has a huge diesel generator because it would cost them a quarter million dollars to, to have PG&E or, or an electrical line dug out to their farm. So they have, instead of having electricity on the farm through um, the utility, they have a big diesel generator and they turn that diesel generator on when they need lights and uh, when they need to power different things. And so the cool proposition is just this idea of if you had no infrastructure, if you had no utility, now you can go and use sun. So the same exact energy that's growing the crop to power the farm because you capture that with solar or if it's wind or geothermal or hydro, you're now using renewable energy that you can store in the battery pack of the tractor. And then when the sun sets and you need lights, you can use the energy from the tractor as an exportable power to power um, your home, your farm, um, and, and the needs that you have. And so the tractor becomes this big energy piece. Um, and when you look at you know, if it's 100 million acres in, in California, the total land, half of that, you know, 43 million are agricultural. The farmlands become a piece of the energy solution. So now you're you're literally mining the farmland for renewable energy to power the on the edge grid, um, which is kind of also an exciting proposition on a future where EVs, whether it's cars or trucks or, um, you know, or tractors can help power um, our needs beyond just getting us from one place to the other. Do you use the tractor yourself at uh, Rain Vineyards? Yes, we do. Yeah, we do. Hey, paint us a picture. What's it like <clears throat> being a farmer who uses it yourself? The first, the first most amazing memory I have with Monarch at Rain was Harvest. Um, and we had we've got two of the pilot series tractors out there to, to do um, a pick. And so we're driving the tractors. We pick in the nighttime in, in California. Um, there's all sorts of reasons. First, it's cooler. So um, it's, it's ideal for the fruit. If you pick the fruit when it's hot and you bring it to the winery and you put it in your tank, um, you kind of lose a lot of the, the, the fruit and flour. So by picking when the fruit's cold, you've helped fix that fruit and flour into the juice of the wine. And so picking at nighttime when it's cold is ideal. But when you pick at nighttime, you need lights. And so forever in a day, um, we'd be out there in the middle of the night and you would just hear the diesel engine rumbling. And you're like, someone turned the tractor off, but you realize that the diesel engine's rumbling just to keep the lights on. And so um, I remember the first pick very well because of how quiet it was. It just, the, the, there was lights, it was quiet, the air quality, you don't realize when you're sitting in a cloud of diesel, um, you know, it's, it's, it's NOx particulate and CO2 that those diesel tractors are just emitting at a huge volume. And you don't realize how um, clean and fresh the air is when you're, when you're not in the presence of that tractor until you're in the presence of an electric tractor and the lights are on and it's quiet. Um, so I think that that was, um, probably one of the biggest aha moments for me of just how nice this transition um, is. And the tractors are not totally silent. You know, when you turn the PT on the hydraulic pump on to engage the implements on the back, which is, you know, this tractor is, is just like any other um, uh, diesel tractor. It's just electric and it has autonomous features and data collection features, but it has a three-point hitch. So it can fit into all the different 
um, implements that we have today as farmers. But when you do connect those, there, there is some noise that's made because the hydraulic pump or the, P, or the PTO spinning, but it's really silent when it's just driving. And so when you're just towing fruit through the field, it's pretty magical. I actually just read The Wide Lens by Ron Adner, and it was talking about how businesses might innovate a new product that's amazing, but if it depends upon an ecosystem of people or businesses or other groups, and you need all of them to basically be on board to make sure you don't get stuck at the last mile, um, you really need to make sure that all the infrastructure is set up so that uh, you don't have incumbents who are blocking your progress, even though nine out of 10 of the people in your ecosystem really love what you do. If one person hates it and they're able to block it or it's inconvenient for them in some way, uh, they might do so. And so businesses need to think quite hard about how to make sure their ecosystem is on board for supporting new technology. Uh, how does that apply here with tractors? I think it's it's always very tough to get um, farms to, to change. And I think that... Um, Thankfully, you know, we have an incredible following, but that when you look at, you have to make investments to migrate away from uh, anything on your farm to something new, right? Whether it's an old implement to a new implement, you have to make an investment. Um, for tractors, our biggest <clears throat> challenges are just, okay, well, we need to set up charging infrastructure. Well, the, the really great thing about that is that um, most barns, most tractor, most farms have the infrastructure for welding and that welding electrical current is the same um, that we need to charge the tractor. Um, so at, at a fast rate, right? Um, and so by being able to um, have that already there, we kind of have a leg up, but still some work needs to happen there. Mm -hmm. But when you look at farms, they've already done that. Most farms have a big old diesel tank. You know, they have things set up there to manage what their investments were early on with the diesel tractors, right? So now we're kind of asking them as farmers to divest from those things and invest into this clean future. And this is kind of one of the reasons why we went to um, the White you know, the White House to talk about um, with, with Congress and the Senate to, to lobby to be a part of the farm bill um, is because there's huge subsidies. You know, this last year globally, the fossil fuel industry was subsidized by a trillion dollars a trillion dollars to help make far, the fossil fuel industry more profitable. And so um, this is one of those areas where I think that we need to shift how we think and say, okay, instead of paying the fossil fuel industry that has so much money and subsidizing them, helping them, um, maybe we need to subsidize and help and take those monies and help the green companies um, that are trying to help, you know, create an environment that we can exist on this planet for longer. Um, and so there's, there's, there's a lot of that happening right now. We have some really cool subsidies happening in California. Um, one's called the Carl Moyer Farmer Program, where you can take a diesel tractor, an old diesel tractor, basically you, you, you have to essentially kill the tractor, but then you get a big subsidy to buy an electric tractor. That's for clusters, but for tractors. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> <That's what I'm laughs> exactly. exactly. And, then, and then there's the um, subsidy, uh, the straight subsidy called the core program. But we need these, and, and, and there's subsidies for solar, and there's subsidies to um, help pay for the electrical infrastructure changes. And some of these are big, like 50% subsidy, 50% you know, of your cost, sometimes more. Um, the core program, 65% with, depending on which air district you're in, it could be even greater, it could get up to 80% sub, like straight cash back um, to, to go to the electric tractor. So we are working on, on trying to funnel some of that fossil fuel pink diesel because every farm has pink diesel, right? And the reason why it's pink diesel is because they get subsidized to use the pink diesel. And the reason why it's pink is so that if, if you're driving down the freeway and a police officer pulls you over, they can they can stick a, a probe down into the, the gas tank to make sure you're not, you know, uh, using subsidized farm fuel for for driving around the town. And so what we're we're trying to say with with uh, the world is, hey, let's subsidize this movement. And it's happening, by the way. It's not, we have an incredible team, um, an impact team that's driven towards trying to help make this transition more smooth for farms. But right now there are lots of challenges and we're we're working through them. The good news is once those transitions are happening, like the electrical charging infrastructure is set up, um, the kind of questions are answered, um, the farmers save a lot. I think like, just like, I think with our first 65 tractors that we deployed this is like a month and a half ago we pulled the numbers um it was something like we had 
operated over 4,000 hours, right around 4,000 hours of operations. We had saved like 250 metric tons of CO2 from being emitted. And we had offset, I think it was 8,500 gallons of fuel from being burnt. So um, it was a big, big number for a very small fleet of tractors. And yeah. that's going to grow exponentially, which is exciting. I always wonder about how much work could be done merely by repealing subsidies because right now, if you have a bunch of fossil fuel subsidies and then you add on a bunch of green farm subsidies, how much work could be done merely by repealing both of them? Like, would you actually need as much subsidization if just you were not competing on an uneven playing field uh, against a policy favorite like fossil fuel? I, I think I think you might be able to win just on all the other benefits you're providing without taxpayer funds being uh, funneled that way. Yeah, I mean, it's all in the end. I think we're all touching that that somehow like it's all being paid for in some way or another by by us by the taxpayers but by fun by funneling those over towards green i think that yeah we'd be saving um our our, our at least it probably the, speeds it up for sure like a farmer <laughs> might not like replace their fleet of of uh machines as soon yeah. as they would if they're getting 80 percent <clears throat> cash back in the right air district like that they, they might wait an additional 10 or 15 years for that machine to crap out yeah well we that i think that's exactly it it'll help speed things up and then the transition, I mean, we're also, you know, we're, we're writing these programs right now with farms, like like 20, 30 climate goals. So like in seven years, if you have 20 tractors, we'll trade out, you know, X amount of tractors every year until 2030 until, and that way, you know, so, and we show, we're able to show and demonstrate, we have a calculator on our website that can demonstrate like, you know, each farmer, you know, might run their tractor 500 hours or a thousand hours. It depends. Every farm has a different kind of um, operational you know, book that they, they, they can like kind of follow. And so by being able to customize with that calculator, how many hours you operate, how much you pay your team, all those things, you can see what your savings would be. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's impactful, but I think that, um, that on top of funneling some of these subsidies over will, is, is helping transition. Cause these are more expensive than uh, a diesel baseline tractor. Although the tractors that I've replaced on my field, these come in just under, because I was paying like a hundred to $110,000 for my diesel tractor, which is crazy. Um, and these are like $89,000, um, but the subsidies get them down significantly right now. And will that, will the cost curve come down too with like mass production? We, <clears throat> so that's a good question. I think that we'll have to like see, but I, I our, one thing Mark said, he's like, if I can build, you know, this is from back in the day, a Model Y Tesla for, you know, whatever is $50,000 or something like this. He's like, I can damn well build a tractor for that type of thing. And so um, the scale of tractors is quite a bit smaller than, than cars. You know, there's, I think like three and a half million tractors sold annually, whereas, you know, <laughs> automobiles is, you know, a, an individual car, I think BMW, sells like 2 million cars a year, something like this. And Tesla's on track to sell 2 million. They're on track to outbeat Tesla in sales this year or, or, or BMW in sales, which is awesome. But the the number, the volume of tractors that moves um, is so much smaller. So that's, I think, yeah. why, yeah. But we also don't have the fancy leather interior and all of those things, but we are leveraging like the whole, this whole sensor suite that's on the tractor with all the cameras and all the kind of GPUs and the ability to connect and all of that. Um, that's leveraging the automotive industry. That's why we're able to get the price down to the price that we are. When when we first launched, we asked people like what what they thought the price would be should be, and it was almost double, if not triple, um, the price that we have. Just wow. because when you look out all of the expensive technology that's on it, it's actually the price has come down significantly on those, making it very 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 accessible, very easy to fix, and all those things. So helps making it far far more frugal, so we can we can afford it. If a listener wants to buy a tractor, if a listener wants to get involved, we do have farmers who listen. It is possible. <laughs> it is true. possible sales come from this. I don't know. I can't guarantee it. Half half of our world's population was farmers. You guys remember, like that was back not that long ago when our grant. So we're just we're we are all descendants of farmers. <laughs> we're all somehow farmers. How can yeah. they? How can they get involved? How can they get in touch? Um, shout out well, your website and and your resources here. Yeah, uh, monarchtractor.com is a great way. Just go through and surf that and, and um, play with the calculator, um, watch some videos. Um, it's, it's uh, I think, the best way to learn about everything that we're doing at Monarch right now. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for hanging with us, Carlo. Always fun to talk about ag. Um, tractor's cool. I, I keep thinking, I'm like, what are, do I need one of these? I obviously do not need one of these. But <laughs> I think the same I, feeling too. I was like, I want this tractor. It's like, like yeah. for what? <laughs> <laughs> well, do you guys have, I, I do, I always say like, if you guys have one or two things to do on your home farm area um, and you have a power wall, like this is a massive, massive power wall. So it's kind of, it's, it, it depends if you're in, uh, depending on what state you're in, the subsidies could make this really compelling from just a power wall perspective because of how much energy density there is compared to the other power walls that are kind of out there. Um, but no, yeah, it's. <laughs> Let's drop it, Shiv. It's, it doesn't, it literally <laughs> makes no sense. It makes negative sense. You're, you're saying we can <laughs> yeah. go in on this together? <laughs> no, we're not going to split a tractor right now. Let's, Carla, this is, the show is getting stupid. It's time to conclude. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Stay Thanks, on. guys. Awesome. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you could please subscribe and give us a great rating and review on Apple Podcasts or a rating on Spotify, that'd be much appreciated. It helps us get our content out to more people. You can sign up for our newsletter at nori.com, follow us on social media, and we will catch you next time.